All right, for uh, those of you who are at my lightning talk at OSTC last year, please don't fall asleep because it is a little bit different this year. Um, the reason for that is that uh, OSIA's focus has changed somewhat uh, during the year. Um, and the, uh, the most obvious manifestation of that is our shiny new tagline, um, this, uh, which you'll see plastered all over your... Uh, I'm in the wrong place, am I? Sorry. Um, <clears throat> which you'll see plastered all over your, uh, your lanyard set and here, here at OSDC, um, amplifying the voice of the, uh, the open source software industry. Now, uh, the reason for, uh, for coming up with that tagline is uh, the board spent a bit of time this year thinking about why we exist and what we should be doing um, and uh, decided basically that we needed to get back to the very beginning what uh, Ian and uh, Brendan and Con and, uh, and Dell had uh, formed OSI for uh, way back 11 years ago, and that was to provide, it, at that point, a voice for the open source software industry here in Australia. Um, I think we're well beyond providing a voice now. A lot of organisations in the industry are big enough that they have their own voices. Um, but we felt there was still a need to amplify it because we do have, we are a bit of a cottage industry. There are some large organisations like Red Hat and IBM out there, um, but there are also a, a heck of a lot of small companies in the open source software industry here. Um, so I think I've jumped ahead a little bit here. For those of you who weren't around last year, don't know who we are, very, very quick recap. OSIA is uh, Open Source Industry Australia. We're the industry body representing open source software companies here. Why do we exist when there are lots of other groups like Linux Australia and, and OSG Club, at least until tomorrow afternoon, uh, et cetera, et cetera? Well, because the industry needs a voice to be seen separately from the community. Uh, the primary reason for that is government. Governments tend to, uh, uh, rightly or wrongly, tend to place more weight on the voice, voices that come from industry than those that, uh, uh, that come from, uh, from the community. Now, we might object to that. Many of us do. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, those are the rules of the game we need to, uh, we, we need to play within. So what we're, what, uh, what, we're, what we're doing now primarily is going back to lobbying government for the, on those issues that are of, uh, of most importance to uh, companies in the open source sector here in Australia. Um, what sort of issues am I talking about? Well, it depends on which forum we're engaging with government on. Uh, we engage with the Commonwealth government at the, at the, at the highest level on international uh, issues, foreign policy, principally treaties, uh, the so-called free trade agreements. Most of, them, most of them have nothing to do with free trade, but that's what they call them anyway. Most of you probably heard of TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. That's the main one we're fighting at the moment. Uh, huge issues there for anyone in the room who runs a, uh, an open source software uh, uh, business, both in the IP chapter, which you've probably heard a lot about through the, uh, the various leaks out there, and also some more obscure ones and things like the government procurement chapter for those of you who do business with government. Uh, things like RCEP, the Regional Cooperative Economic Partnership, which is a TPP-like thing, which is on the horizon as well. Um, we're keeping a watching brief on that. Uh, Commonwealth for uh, for the Commonwealth government uh, domestic policy issues, uh, on the other hand, are a real mixed bag. Uh, these can again be things to do with copyright reform, patent reform. Uh, uh, but also uh, such diverse things as uh, uh, reform of the education system, along the lines of uh, uh, what Ian was, was talking about earlier today, but actually institutionalising uh, some of those sorts of things. Uh, it could be, uh, it could be about procurement policy, it could be about standards uh, setting, uh, or, or virtually anything else. For example, we recently lodged a submission with IP Australia, uh, one of the rare objections when we weren't objecting to something, uh, actually supporting... Uh, uh, ASIP's revised recommendation uh, to uh, abolish the innovation patent system because, of course, most software patents in Australia to date have been innovation patents rather than, than, uh, than standard patents. Uh, it doesn't solve the software patent problem, but it's a big step in the right direction. Um, we had lodged a, uh, a submission to the original ASIP review recommending that they not only abolish the innovation patent system but also get rid of software patents two years earlier. We didn't quite achieve that outcome, but we got a good step in the right direction. Uh, similarly, there was a submission to the ACARA review in relation to education. Uh, I'm not going to list the whole, a whole lot of them. We don't do quite as much at a state level, but we do start get 
involved with the state governments to, uh, to some extent. Uh, for example, uh, those of you from New South Wales may or may not be uh, aware that the uh, New South Wales Procure IT framework is under review at the moment. One of our members brought to our attention about the time of OSGC last year that uh, uh, the current New South Wales Procure IT is, uh, actively discriminates against uh, open source suppliers. Uh, only on systems integration pro uh, elements of major projects, but nevertheless discriminates against open source companies. Uh, we've discovered more recently that, the, uh, uh, that there are issues around the current draft uh, that's being reviewed, extending that discrimination to all New South Wales government projects. And that's something obviously we're actively trying to, uh, uh, trying to uh, fix. Um, and to their credit, uh, the Department of uh, Finance Services and Innovation in New South Wales have really been quite good at working with us uh, towards those aims. So, look, I've probably taken way more than the, the five minutes uh, uh, that I was, I was given already, but uh, I just thought you'd be interested in knowing a little bit about the organisation uh, whose name you're wearing around your, uh, your neck this week. Um, and for those of you who do want to know more, either stick around for the OSIRE AGM at the end of the conference tomorrow, I'll, I'll say a little bit more there, um, or come see me afterwards, or if you want to help out, several ways you could do it. You could, if, you're, if you're an open source business owner, you could join OSIA, just go to the website, osia.com.au. Um, if you're not an open source business owner, you could pester your boss to join OSIA. Um, or alternatively, if your organisation's a little bit better off, you could, you could sponsor us because it does take a lot of uh, money to uh, do things like fly around and lobby politicians, um, which is the point we're getting to now. Um, and uh, alternatively, if you simply want to draw our attention to something we should be objecting to or supporting that we're not already, uh, just tell us. Uh, there's a mailing list, osia-members at osia.com.au, which anybody can join despite the name. You don't have to be a member. Uh, you do need to be a member to vote, but uh, not just to point us in the right direction. So feel free to do that. But most importantly, if you care passionately about the sorts of issues I've been talking about, TPP, um, copyright reform, patent reform, uh, uh, fairness in, uh, in government IT procurement, please stick your hand up and volunteer to uh, join one of the committees we've got working on, uh, on uh, these sorts of uh, advocacy issues. Uh, we're uh, perhaps not quite as well set up as uh, uh, the gentleman who was speaking before, uh, but we have had some successes and uh, look forward to some more. So I've taken too much of your time already, so uh, thank you everyone. I'll hand over to Ian. Thank you. Excellent. Yes. So, lightning talks now. Um, anyone still want to do a lightning talk that hasn't put their name up here? We will have time. Go on, you know you want to. Okay. Anyway, Paul Waper first, after that, Ronan. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So, that should be on. Yep. Sounds good. Um, so, my tagline in my description on the RSDC uh, speaker section is that I collect esoteric hobbies. Um, in 2008, let's see if I can drag it over there and make it full screen. Yep, that looks good. I um, I collected riding a motorbike as an esoteric hobby. Um, yeah, it's going to go straight forward. Okay, let me go to full screen, but not slideshow. Good. Okay. Um, now, this was fun. Riding a motorbike is fun. It's cheaper than, ride, the, than driving a car. Uh, you get a lot more enjoyment seeing the open space around you and watching out for cars. Um, and, but I realised that I was, you know, you're still using fuel. It was just about that time where people were talking about um, more practical electric cars. Tesla was just starting up. And, and so forth, but there were no electric motorbikes on the horizon. So I thought, well, how hard can it be to build one? Um, so I went and got a, um, a motorbike. Uh, I found a really good place to buy cheap motorbikes, which is from a, a, uh, a wrecker. Uh, this was a bike that I got um, that had been in an accident, still um, repairable, so it's a, a what they call a repairable write-off. Uh, the problem was that when um, so the, there are there are a bunch of bent bits in it, 
Um, but the best part was that the uh, engine was damaged anyway, so no one was going to use that. Uh, so I tore that out. Um, I then tore the rear wheel off because I decided to use a hub motor in the rear wheel. Um, there it was, back on its two wheels, and you can see in, inside that enclosure there, uh, that big black bit is actually the motor. It's a 30 kilowatt motor, uh, it does 10 kilowatts continuous. Um, then I got my P plates, which meant I could ride all sorts of things and actually pillion people and things like that. So that was a good advancement in my esoteric hobbies. Um, and I started putting more of the electric motorbike together. I got some fairings for it. Um, and I bought the batteries. Um, now the interesting thing here is that you can see that they take a, that's a 60 amp hour, 120 volt, um, 38 cell lithium ion phosphate battery. Um, and it, it, the equivalent in lead acid batteries takes up the entirety of my boot. So that's a considerable space saving. It still means that it's a bit difficult to work, fit them into the motorcycle. So I used cardboard aided design um, to, to figure out how to put the batteries in. Figured out, I found out that you could put them in sideways, which was a real advance that made, made it a lot easier. Um, then I taught myself a bit of CAD, uh, real computer-aided design, um, found a company that does water jet cutting and got some aluminium panels cut to hold the batteries in place. Um, and then I basically worked out that I could fit them in there, all 38 of them, um, without too many uh, bent bits. And uh, then I had a miracle. Uh, I avoided wrapping myself around a large um, metal post when I was testing it. Um, I'd got it working and I was riding it on a spare piece of road and I didn't notice because uh, it was dark and my headlights weren't working correctly that there was a large fence. Um, fortunately, I hit a speed bump in front of it and wrote, wrote the previous bike off. So I bought a new one because you do. I've already invested you know, 30 to 38 $3,800 in batteries alone, so you might as well keep on going. Um, and I did some wiring. That's the that's that's yeah, that's really simple stuff. The the inside of the wiring now is much more complicated than that. Um, and in and tried the fairings out. I took it up with a friend's motorbike uh, who was also com converting it to electric uh, up to some racing. There's. Uh, Tony's bike on the left and my bike on the right. Um, Tony then got his registered, so he was first, curse him. Uh, but that just meant I had to keep on going. Uh, and I persisted. Um, you can see there um, the black, it's hard to see on the screen, but that bit there is actually complete custom made fiberglass panel built by a guy that I found that also did some of the welding that I needed on the bike. Uh, and if you're ever going to do this kind of thing, I recommend finding someone who can do things like make fiberglass panels and weld, because that's really, really handy. Um, and so this is me taking it off to the registry office, um, and I came back with a fully registered electric motorbike. Um, and I, um, I, they finally handed me over the, the, the registration plate, um, and I said, I, sorry, I, I just have to do this. Woohoo! <laughs> and that was it. I had a registered motorbike. Thank you very much. Ronan. And after that, there's a certain Orion. Sure. Would it be okay? Okay. By the way, I'm, I'm quietly keeping ahead of the time. Um, I've got a timer here, but I haven't got anything up there. So and we've, we seem to have plenty of time anyway, um, because there's not that many people doing a talk today. I'm still hopeful for extra candidates. Oh, dear. Nope. Mm -mm.
one, two, one, two, yeah, going. Okay, cool. So my talk is about the fact that I love camping. My wife doesn't really. So the solution was five star camping. So how do you do five star camp? How do you do five star camping? It's not starts, it's star. <laughs> this is what happens when you do it this morning. So first you buy a caravan. Okay? Nothing fancy, you know, uh, quite cheap actually. Uh, the other option is to buy her a diamond ring. But that comes with the risk that we'll actually find what really happens on this night drop. So I went with the I went with the uh, first option and that's quite boring because it's just a caravan, nothing to talk about. But that was really one just the once the first step. Now it's quite depressing after this motorbike because this is really you know cool and my stuff is really just DIY stuff. So the first thing you do is just start to cut holes in it. And the idea was there was no electric provision in this caravan because when they sold it to the first owner, he didn't want any batteries in it, and I did. So uh, I started to think, okay, I'm going to put some control panel in it so I can see what happens. And that's um, above the fridge, and it's a three-way fridge. Three-way fridge has a problem. If they stop walking, you have no idea because they're quiet. And you find out just a day later and everything is warm, the beer, which is the biggest problem. But then the food, and it takes another day to cool down. So I wanted to see how the, the fridge is acting uh, almost real time. So the first thing I did is trying a stainless steel. And then you find out stainless steel sucks. It's really hard to work with it. So, you know, Timber and Cabinet Maker friend um, will do just fine. And this is... Oh, barely can see it, but it's a, it's a basically a box that the current maker did for me. And at the bottom, you hardly can see, but here there are two um, LCD uh, displays that show me the inside temperature and the outside of the boiler. So if the boiler stops working very quickly, within you know 20, 30 minutes, I'm starting to see that the temperature goes down from 50 to whatever is outside. If it's 40, it will be very close to it but I can see immediately that something is going wrong. And then you start to mess with stuff that actually works well, and you just want to mess with it. So this little thing is, um, again, for a three-way fridge, uh, when you run them on 12 volts, they are using a lots and lots and lots of uh, power from the battery, and they actually can draw all the power from the battery. So you put this, this little thing sends when the car one is moving, it means that it's now driving, it's connected to the car, there's an alternator to charge it, and it's actually walking. As soon as you stop after three minutes, it will cut um, the fridge down. So you won't kill your battery when you go out to the shops to um, or to eat on your way. And they use all sorts of uh, nice connectors that no one ever seen. And it's actually cool. It's instead of using screws and stuff, it's actually quick clips and it's nice. And then you take your air conditioner and decide that it's not cold, it's not cold enough. You can't control it really fine grain and you add this little thing that you can see over here which is a, a thermostat that can cut um, the um, cut in and out the air condition it's not working and don't forget the game this is supposed to be what you do and not do the other stuff so then you really get lazy and this is a video I have to show you so in here comes a video I couldn't embed it because just because So then you create this, it's, it's basically a toolbox that has a pump in it and it has some uh, pressure switch and a battery and you put this next to the stream with a long hose uh, to basically bring you water from the stream up to the caravan because you don't want to take um, big buckets up the stream and trust me, it can be quite heavy, especially in the Murray where the bank is, um, you know, 10 meters high. And this is the setup for the washing. So this is where the water comes into. And this, this is a hot, instant hot system and all the washing that most of the time I have to do. And then next thing, you release the beast. All right, no, release the beasts. Okay, because there are more that are coming. And always obey the law and safety first, always. And then basically you're done and you can enjoy. This is a, a nice band on the Mari that uh, we spend some time in. The next step will be um, a tracking, a sun tracker solar device with Raspberry Pi that will track the sun through the day so I don't have to go there and change the location of it because I want to be lazy. And that's it.
That was five minutes to the second. That was five minutes to the second. Wow. Perfect. <laughs> I don't need five, so five is good. Okay. Have I started? Okay. That's nice. I'd like to turn you, tell you about, about the Rubik's Cube. Um, now, unfortunately, and I will solve it while we're talking, um, unfortunately, um, other skills, lightning talks, while invented by me a couple of years ago, are a real problem for me now, because essentially everything that used to be other skills for me are now part of OpenStem, which means I don't have anything left now, because I now tossed a ginger beer into the classroom. I've done cheese making, I'm pretty sure. I know some high schools who actually do cheese making, so you know that's kind of part of what I could be doing anyway. Um, yeah, so it's a bit of a problem. Um, so I'll admit this kind of stuff. We do do it with classes. I'm playing with the Rubik's Cube with a couple of, um, um, a couple of kids in primary school. Um, it is not mathematics, as far as I'm concerned. It's a pattern recognition thing. And some kids have a bit of a talent for that, but haven't got much exposure to it. And Rubik's cubes, cubes kind of go out and in, and it's a bit of a geek thing. It's a bit of a hidden thing. So I try to bring it into more places. Um, I don't see any particular reason at this point to put it in classrooms and do it with entire classes. Um, the reason for that is that some people are really, really not interested in these things. So rather than soldering and, and programming or whatever, which you can usually get most kids along with and they can work together, this is something you hold in your hand and you can't really have a discussion with another kid about which things turn next. It doesn't really work that way. So um, yeah, so we've got some kids uh, playing with that and it, that's been quite interesting so far. Um, but what I'd like to tell you about is this is a speed cube and I've only had this for about a year, Claire? I think about a year. Um, and it's been, been a bit of a life-changing event. Um, I'm suddenly faster. Um, I thought, I'm actually so slow. I used to do about two minutes 10, which is not bad at all, and I've been doing that for the last 25 years, um, since, since late primary school when, when the thing first came about in our, uh, in our, in our environment. Um, that's fine. Um, yes, because I'm doing it slow and having a conversation at the same time. So, um, what I found though, is that while I was doing two minutes and a bit before, I can now do this cube in one minute 40. Um, obviously not as I'm doing it right now. Um, the reason for that is that these cubes are just very, very smooth. They are much faster. Now this particular cube, this model of cube, was used by a fellow whose name I can never remember. He's from Melbourne, he was about 14 at the time. And he set a new world record to 6.4 seconds. Same cube. Ah, exactly. I respect that. I will never be that fast. Um, the formulas they use are slightly different from mine, so I know that they use tricks, but you know they still have to do the same number of moves. And, and that's what I'd like to tell you about. I'm just amazed about what these essentially kids do. Um, they are just freaking fast. It is really cool. Um, how fast is a computer solving these things? You know, there are Arduinos and, and Android phones attached to a bit of mechanics and they solve these, these cubes as well. Um, they don't solve it much faster. I think the world record is currently at four point something seconds or five seconds or whatever. Um, robots are pretty much at the same speed. It seems to me that we're getting close to the actual speed of the, um, the physical speed of the cube rather than the, um, you know, rather than any particular aspect of a human being faster or slower. Um, so I'll probably, how much time do I have left? I can do that. I'll focus on this now so I actually finish it, which is what I promised to myself. <laughs> Just to make the point. Anyway, the, oh dear, what did I do? Oh, for, I, no, I completely screwed it, which means I probably won't really, whoops, no, yep, got it. Um, yep, um, can fix it. Anyway, what I'd like to encourage you guys um, is, what am I doing? <laughs> oh my goodness. This is dreadful. This is really dreadful. Anyway, okay, probably fail, never mind. That's always the joy. Oh, no, no, no. How long, 20? Okay, I can probably still do that. 
Hmm. Okay. Of course, I really can't obviously have a conversation. Kid, uh, people can't multitask. People say they can multitask, but it's really not true. 18. Hmm. Okay. And that goes in there. How are we feeling? This thing really messes with my glasses. Ah, uh, there we go. Yay! All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, so how about uh, cocktails? So I'm really into making cocktails. Uh, yeah, woo. Um, I, I basically read some recipe books front to back, uh, really old ones, so I'm really into old classic cocktails. Um, a cocktail uh, is only a cocktail if it adheres to these two simple rules, uh, which gives you a broad scope. It has to have three ingredients, and one of them has to be alcohol. And by the way, uh, this is like a 101 class in five minutes. So if you are into alcohols, you might, or into cocktails, you might, you might be advanced. Um, so with this in mind, there's one thing, if you can take it away from this talk, uh, above anything else, which is a martini is not a cocktail. <laughs> it's called a duo. There's a very specific thing. It has two ingredients. That is not an ingredient. That is a whole other talk. Most, mostly red. So, uh, classic recipes have, uh, have patterns. Um, so here's a common one. Eight parts to two parts to one parts. So I've simplified this down uh, with an example. Obviously, two Australians, a half an Australian, and, and a quarter of an Australian. Um, so let's, let's take this one for example. Uh, the predecessor to a martini is a Martinez, which is a cocktail. Uh, it's gin. Uh, sweet vermouth and maraschino liqueur. My slide program converted the parts to percentages. That's entirely unhelpful. Um, but this is a Martinez. So an old-fashioned uh, bourbon or rye, you get to pick. Uh, syrup and bitters. Uh, and that's it, by the way. Syrup is also sugars. Um, if you put what's called the kitchen sink into this thing, you're making a post-prohibition era uh, cocktail, which is not a classic cocktail, and I reject that entire notion. Daiquiris, uh, light rum, lime juice, and syrup. Uh, so this is a daiquiri, and if you would like to make, say, a strawberry daiquiri, take the lime juice out and throw some strawberries in, or throw them both in. It's entirely up to you. Uh, now, this is where it gets cool. Pisco Sour, a uh, classic of South America. Um, replace the rum with Pisco. Use the same uh, quantities, and you have a Pisco Sour. Now, you should throw an egg white in here. And you should shake the hell out of that. Whiskey sour, whiskey, lemon juice, syrup. Simple ingredients. Also throw an egg white in there if you want to do it right. You don't have to, um, but you kind of have to. So <laughs> Tom Collins. Uh, these are the basic ingredients of a Tom Collins. Now, what do we see here? Another pattern. What if we just replace the whiskey with gin? Then we have a Tom Collins. Now you should also add soda into this. Um, the old joke, by the way, have you heard of Tom Collins? Or, or have you seen Tom Collins? Uh, pre predates this drink, actually. Um, this was a prank. Uh, people would run out into the street and ask you, have you seen Tom Collins? Because he's talking about you. And, uh, and then they would get you to come to the bar, and then you would have to drink at the bar. <laughs> Margarita is tequila Cointreau lime juice, sidecar. Uh, throw cognac in there. Uh, Jack Rose, these apple jack, which is beautiful. Uh, mint julep, uh, bourbon syrup, and mint. And then a bunch of crushed ice. 
Um, this is another classic pattern. Uh, there are more, but I'm going to show you two. Uh, how about the Negroni? Uh, gin, Campari, and Sweet Vermouth. Uh, the Vucure. Uh, you can keep the Sweet Vermouth and just go with Rye and Cognac instead. You should also throw some bitters and uh, uh, a couple of other things in there, but that's a basic Vucure. And then a White Russian, which is not quite a classic because it uses vodka, which is a nonsense spirit that you should never use in a cocktail. But uh, in any case, vodka liqueur, uh, coffee liqueur, and cream. Um, read this entire book, uh, The uh, Fine Art of Mixing Drinks by David Embury. It is a fantastic uh, recipe book, and he uses the, uh, the relative ratios rather than specific uh, amounts, and you have to decide the amounts for yourself, but it is a fantastic read. That's it. Thank you. All right, last chances. Anybody? Hard act to follow, but still, you know, there's, there's lots of people doing cool stuff. <laughs> okay, who is for Paul reading <laughs> a romance novel? <laughs> One, two, three. Go on, keep your paw up if you really feel for it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Who is against? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, I think you get the. <laughs> <laughs> How long does he get? Tell the tale. Tell me. Oh, okay. So this, everyone, this is from Taken by Storm. And um, this is one of the best books I've ever read. Uh, you cannot get this edition anymore. It's, um, this is the first edition. All the editions now are revised and edited, and you'll understand why. <laughs> They've just had a fight, and to let you know, Shereb is the horse. <clears throat> Her face hot with shame, she glanced away, and at the side of the road saw a flock of sheep aligning the perimeter of a stone fence, gazing at the animal doctor's back with wide-eyed, ovine adoration. She stared in astonishment. The veterinarian turned his head to follow her gaze. The animals pressed themselves against the fence as though trying to get closer to him. One let out a soft bleat, and then another, and then the rest of the flock followed suit until the whole group was bleating and barring. Colin? He was still gazing at the sheep, beginning to smile a little. Colin? He turned then and shook his head as though trying to clear it and looked away. Ariadne stared at him. Again she sensed the eerie pull that animals felt towards this gentle man and had a sudden strange feeling of standing on the fringe of a circle that she could never be part of. Again, she saw him falling from Shereb's back, and the thought of him lying dead, his neck broken, his body crushed, sent a shaft of, of icy terror and grief straight through her heart. In pertinence aside, he was becoming very dear to her, this man. If anything had happened to him, how much time do I have left? Four. <laughs> Excellent. Three minutes ten. <laughs> I will. I'm just going to skip forward a little bit then. <clears throat> she raised her chin. They've they've had a little bit of a discussion. They've raised. She raised her chin, trying to command Horter and failing miserably. Her hands were trembling. Her nerves quaking. She had the awful feeling that he could look into her eyes and read every one of her wicked, wanton thoughts. She looked down, pretending a sudden interest in the fabric of her sleeve. I suppose I shall go straight to Hades for admitting this, but I think that I feel drawn to you just like these animals. That's it, isn't it? Animal attraction, nothing more. I'm as helpless against it, just, just like Shereb, just like... She gave a little laugh and jerked her head to a side to indicate us to the flock of sheep, just like those stupid beasts over there. She set her jaw to keep her mouth from trembling and toyed with a thread on her sleeve, feeling his heavy gaze upon her. A long moment passed, 
At last she heard him clear his throat, and then his warm hand tentatively grasped hers. Ariadne. She swallowed hard. What? There is nothing to forgive. She turned and looked up at him. Her heart ached with guilt, with wanting to touch him, holding him, and yes, to kiss him. But she could not tell him that. She could never tell him that. Instead, she reached up and hesitantly touched his hair and his beautiful, silky, shining hair. Oh, Colin, I... Well, you don't know, but I think that you're an attractive man. And some of the things I've done about because I could not help myself. I didn't do them out of a devious wish to torment and tease you. I know. But do you? Of course, Ariadne. You're young, but no good can come of it. You've said it yourself. We are as alike as... And he grinned, more charming than he had a right to be, more handsome than she remembered Maxwell, her fiancé, as being. And she felt her chest constrict with a raw, unfulfilled ache that twisted her heart like a dish rag. <laughs> we are as alike as the digestive systems of the dog and a horse. Oh, Colin. I will do a boff if people want. I'm speechless. <laughs> My third life. Please don't do that again. Thank you, Paul, for taking, for taking uh, other skills lightning talks to a whole new level. I hope you haven't traumatized Ian too much. Um, I will try to recover him later. Uh, that brings us to the end of um, our second wonderful day uh, of the official, the, the, the normal, the conference part. You know what I mean. Um, <laughs> um, I would like to again thank our uh, sponsors, Automatic, Red Hat, Sousa, Elastic, um, and Osaya, and uh, in addition, uh, Adam from Strategic Data and um, Osaya and the OSD Club for um, their wonderful contribution to drinks last night. That was awesome. Um, round of applause for all those people, please. <laughs> Um, we also, interestingly, uh, have a small uh, and quite good article published about us in The Advocate, which is a local paper from the Northwest, which you can probably see a copy of on the registration desk. That's kind of cool. Um, next, we have the OSD Club AGM. So um, people sticking around for that would be good. Um, apparently, it won't take long, and it's quite exciting. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then after that, we've got boffs. There are three boff sessions listed. We have blue hackers, we have a crypto things key signing boff, and we have uh, virtual worlds, how to install an open world, which um, Mark and Morgan were going to run that one, and Morgan is presently lying down with a migraine. Um, so if she reappears, or if Mark wants to do that uh, solo, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, I figured we'd just uh, embrace the chaos and um, assume that crypto things might happen in here because there might be more people and the other two might be split up out there, but let's um, see how we go after the AGM. Does that sound good? Cool, awesome. Um, that's it. <laughs>